we concluded tonight's class by understanding who we are supposed to hate. Please share with someone who will benefit. If you see your friend sinning, the Talmud doesn't say if you see a Jew sinning. It says you see a friend. So who's this, who's this friend we're talking about? What does it mean a friend? So a friend has two components, as we're going to explain. A friend means someone who is on a comparable level to yours in Judaism. And someone you have an emotional relationship with that you call them your friend. So right away, we just took that like millions and millions and millions of people that we can see sitting out there and saying, well, are they on your level of Judaism? No. Okay, we just knocked them all off. <laughs> we got like 500 left. And then you have his emotional relationship with them. Now we're down to maybe three. <laughs> Meaning, if someone's not on your level of Judaism and you would see them sinning, it's very possible that they're sinning from lack of knowledge. They're sinning because of whatever they're going through in life. We're supposed to try to help such people. We're supposed to try to educate such people. But what would be the point in hating them? Well, you could say in general, what would be the point in hating anyone? Why would God want us to hate another Jew or anyone for that matter? So this is discussed. And basically the idea of this hatred, this emotion of hatred is as a wake up call for them to repent. So if you're talking about someone who is weaker than you in Judaism, it's very likely that hatred, negative emotion, I mean, hatred is such an intense word, but this negative emotion wouldn't be a wake up call. It would be a turn off. They wouldn't have the sensitization that you're acting this way because it would be like, oh, you know, you only like me if I do what you want me to do. So in no way would that emotion inspire them to come closer to God. Would it be a reminder they should be behaving differently? It would just be, as I'm saying, a complete negative experience. It's not, it's not relevant to their world. Even someone who is on your level of religious observance. And therefore, seemingly, if you're aware enough of this Tom of injunction, so should they be. And they do have more sensitization to understand and appreciate that what they're doing is wrong. And that's why you're treating them this way. Even they, it only works if they know you really care about them. If they know you're their friend. Because otherwise, again, they'll be like, you don't like me anyway. You know, you're you're not looking out for my best, best interest anyway. Maybe you're treating me poorly because that makes you feel good. You're putting me down so you can feel better about yourself. So only if I really know you care about me can I accept that what you're doing is coming from love. And then, then I could be receptive to it. Because actually... We are also told that when we see someone sinning, we have an obligation to rebuke them. How many times? Until they don't let you anymore. It says even a hundred. And if you did a hundred and you can still keep talking to them, keep going. When do you stop? When they don't let you talk anymore. So who am I supposed to do that to? Again, only a person who will accept it from you. Because if they don't feel you have a relationship with them, you understand them, you care about them as an individual, not as the broad body of the Jewish people, they wouldn't accept it from you anyway. So just as you can only rebuke that person who truly knows you really, really care, and that's why you're rebuking, it's the same thing with this as well. As the rebel will explain. Hainu, meaning to say, if we look at the precision of wording of the Talmud, the chaveiro v'tayru mitzvahs. Friend means your friend in your service of God, meaning someone on your level of Torah and the commandments. And 
You already fulfill the commandment, you shall surely rebuke your friend. Meaning, you can't at the same time be feeling a hatred of him and rebuking him. Obviously, then your rebuke is not going to work. So as long as you're in a position to rebuke him, you can't have this negative emotion for him. So maybe you're not in a position to rebuke him because he's not a person you can rebuke, as the rebel soon explain. Well, then you can never come to step two and have this hatred. And if he is a person that you can rebuke, as long as you're rebuking, you also can't have this emotion because then how could you be rebuking him? So it can only come after him. And, it can all, and again, you only stop rebuking when he doesn't let you talk to him about it anymore. How do we derive from the commandment of rebuking this idea of someone equitable to you in your relationship to God? So the verse says in the Hebrew, we did a lot of this focus on Hebrew language this class. Hocheach tochiach means I shall surely rebuke, because it says it twice, the same word, rebuke, rebuke. Es amisecha. Hmm. What does that word mean? Amisecha. I see the word am. Maybe that's nation, someone from your nation. So the sages say the word amisecha, we actually break up into two words. Im she'itcha. Amisecha, if you were like trying to figure it out, put a line in between the mem and the yud. Take that five letter word and make the first two letters a word and the last three. Am, vocalize it with the e, im, and the final three letters, yit, yud, safcha, becomes itcha. Im she'itcha. The one who is with you. So now if I'm looking back at that verse, Thou shalt surely rebuke the one who is with you. Okay, now what does that mean? So the sages continue to explain, with you, and the only thing that's valuable, with you and God, with you and serving God. In she'itcha v'toro u'bemitzvah. The one who is with you on your level of serving God. So again, we have this discussion in the Talmud. That if you see your friend sinning, you have to hate him and tell your teacher to hate him. Well, that only applies once you can no longer rebuke him. But rebuking only applies if he's with you in your relationship to God. So if he's not with you, then you can't rebuke him. And if you can't rebuke him, if you can't go to stage one, you can never get to stage two. So that wipes away everyone else in the world from both of these commandments. If someone's holding in a different relationship with God than yours. He's not holding, he doesn't have the background you have. He doesn't have the practical application of that background. He's not serving God on your level. You can't rebuke him. He's not going to take it from you. And you therefore can never come to stage two and hate him. Only someone who first you can do stage one. He's with you in terms of your level of observance and therefore you have the ability to rebuke him if additionally he's also with you on an emotional level and he knows you love him and he knows you're doing it because you care and then you just keep rebuking and keep rebuking you could keep rebuking for the rest of your life when do you stop when he says don't talk about this anymore and then if you didn't see him repenting you would need to go to stage two, but we're not really completely going to say that either. But even, even at this point, only then, and only for such a person who's with you on your level of observance, who you rebuked limitless times until he doesn't let you anymore, and who you have that emotional relationship with. Only then would you go to the second point of this follow-up follow command. Any questions on this? I was obviously in the middle of the concept, but any questions on this thus far? It's interesting because you could see, of course, we all know how we're in the seventh generation of Chabad and how the Rebbe revolutionized Chabad and, and the world and Judaism and this whole perspective on how we look at every Jew. But we see here all the roots, the philosophical underpinnings of everything we are doing is was all written here some 200 plus years ago, 
in the first generation of Chabad by the Alter Rebbe, of course, coming from the two generations of general Hasidists started by the Baal Shem Tov, in terms of how we look at every Jew. And therefore, even when we have a command, we're like, wait a minute, that has to fit within our worldview, and how does it? Okay, so we are in the middle. But we will stop at this point. Um, does anyone have something they would like to share? Any, any, anyone have something they would like to share? Anything they would like to thank God for? Or any miracle they would like to share? I have two. Oh, great. Last week, I was um, actually listening from New York. Um, we went to New York um, and met up with, uh, with our daughters so, and their families. So um, Eliyahu went home before I did. And I was debating if I should send my Shabbos shoes home because I was going to be by Chaya. And then I didn't send them. I said, maybe there'll be something. And there was. I I went to the L'chaim. Oh, that's so nice. For, you got to be L'chaim. For, yeah. So it was it was really special. Um, my son-in-law Chaim, Chaya's husband, he had a, he went to 770 for Myrov. So he 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 dropped me off at free. It was absolutely perfect. Wow. It was so nice. To go so and, to, nice. and to and to and to be there and to That's to beautiful. share in the simcha. From the simcha. That's so beautiful. Yeah, it was it was it was really special. And then Friday, this was really a miracle. Um, I go I go um, you know a, a couple of minutes before lichbenshin into Chaya, and I hear my oldest anakal dive bear screaming. I, I I didn't know what happened, and Chaya says. Quick, my bench had solas on the way, and no, really. And um, he 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 sat down. She gave them to eat, and the baby um, Zalman pulled the tablecloth in hot soup, went all over like dive bears, you know, his like by his hips and thighs, and he was sitting in it kind of. And then they put him in the in the bath, and hot sola came after we bench lift, but. Where he got burnt wasn't as bad as other places. He could have got gotten burnt, and they bandaged him up, and they sent pictures to the pediatrician who said he didn't have to go to the hospital, Baruch Hashem. And then they came back to rebandage him on Shabbos. So he's, you know, he's kvetchy and it hurts, but it's getting Baruch Hashem B'liyai and Hara better every day. And I, I just thank Hashem he didn't have to go to the hospital and you know they're they're really taking good care of it and they had a family hasana last night so he was able to go but it's very scary those those little ones are wilder than anything he wow. just pulled the plastic tablecloth I could totally see it and the hot soup and I could totally envision it and yes wow <laughs> and then That's afterwards incredible. He went, Zalman went over to the Licht and put one out and he had like a manicure of wax all over one of his hands. I mean, really, he, he needs to go like into baby jail for <laughs> at least a year or something till he grows out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a man's choice. Baruch Hashem, we say there are many, many malachim, many angels. Yeah, you know, so so I'm I'm very grateful. Goldie? Um, there we go. Um, I I think I mentioned the last time that I, um, that I was here that um, I have a friend who has you been did. diagnosed and you with... by the eye health, yeah. Yeah, so diagnosed with some very aggressive, severe, fast-moving Yenamachla. And um, at any rate, uh, they had... Um, some very major scans this past week. And then uh, yesterday I went uh, to hear what the, the final outcome was, whether it had metastasized or what. And the doctor said, we don't understand how it couldn't, it, how it hasn't metastasized. It's massive. It's a massive tumor. How on earth did it not? Okay. That's, that's number one. 
And then number two, it also, it's jammed in between multiple organs but hasn't attached itself to any of them. So it's potentially going to be able to just be removed. Wow. <laughs> so that was Nicenism for sure. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Wow. That is unbelievable. She should see a complete, complete, complete reforce. And it's amazing sometimes what we're doing spiritually. I, I was involved with a certain woman, a non Jewish woman in Russia, that um, if it had stage, was in stage four. And she took on herself to keep the seven Noahide laws and to try, you know, where she could to spread them. She was in stage four and it completely, completely reversed. And she, thank God, is healthy and alive until today. So we, we can never really understand this person, this person, you know, everyone obviously a different situation, but um, yeah. Oh sure. When I was uh, when I was younger, they gave me a five percent chance of living longer than five years, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> God is very powerful, and it's just sometimes we we don't understand. Of course, this person is it, but we just when we when we see it, we see it. Unbelievable, unbelievable. So I do have to say thank you, Hashem, for the miracle of my daughter getting. Yes, so but exciting. I have to say that. I am very, very grateful for the miracle. It's definitely God that makes matches. And I'm very grateful. And um, I also have two miracles. One was that she got engaged. And the second miracle that I want to thank Hashem for is that my granddaughter, um, Sterney, was coming to the Wachayim, and she was in a um, serious car crash. And the person driving, the car flipped over into a ditch and, and um, totally flipped upside down. The car was totaled, and, um, and she... I mean, she totally um, flipped over and got stuck under the seat. She was, they took her to the hospital and she was um, shaken up, but all the, and scratched up, but from all the testing, there was nothing, no serious damage. And she was released from the hospital and actually came to the Lachayim. Wow. But I I think it was an absolute, absolute miracle. I, I want to thank Hashem for the miracle because, wow. yeah, there's not really much of an explanation of how she was saved and protected because she was actually laying down in the back seat and she was not buckled in. So it was totally a miracle. Wow. So thank Hashem for that. We should continue to see the miracles in the good. Like in Peggy's engagement, that's what we want. Just good and good and good, but we're very grateful and very appreciative. Hashem. She always have good things to report. Anyone else? All right. Well, Elise, um, that, that's, uh, wow, a lot of things to be thankful to. And we probably, every day, you know, we say in our prayers that every day we're thanking God for the miracles, the wonders, and the goodness. And it's really there every day of our life. So thank you, Sharon, for coming. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. My honor and pleasure. Yes, representing all of us. Okay, you represented Chicago. What Manucha Gershon was there? Who else was there from? Uh, I really didn't know her, but I kind of met her from um, Merchai and, and Rivka Ben Chion's community that lives in Crown Heights now, but I, I don't really don't really know her. But she's she looked, I, I know you. I, she looked familiar. So nice, blonde light. Yes. So in 1991, on this week's Torah portion, a the Rebbe said, I'm not going to say the whole thing because obviously it's a long piece they they pulled out here, but just this one part. 
Practically speaking, we have to publicize and to arouse in every place about the special service of this month of Elul that's beginning again, Shabbos, as we said in the beginning of this class, that's alluded to in the five verses. We have five verses that each of them spell out, make like an acrostic of the word Elul, that allude to the services of prayer, of Torah study, of kindness, of repentance, and of redemption. We have five verses, each one, if we take the first letters of each verse, spells out the word Elul, prayer, Torah study, kindness, repentance, and redemption, with a special emphasis on redemption, as it penetrates all of our service, that everything we should do should be done in the spirit of redemption, especially, of course, as we learn Torah about redemption, from an anticipation and an absolute certainty that immediately, literally, our physical eyes will see, behold, this one, King Mashiach, is coming. Or we could even say king. And simply speaking, the rabbi says, and this is in italics, like the rabbi said this very strongly, to declare and to publicize in every place with words emerging from the heart that God said through his servants, the prophets, the following week, the rabbi is going to basically say how he's a prophet. At this point, he didn't say it yet. He just said he's like foreshadowing through his servants, the prophets, to each and every Jew. See, this is the opening verse of the Torah portion. See, I have given today before you the blessing. So that's the opening verse of the Torah portion. But the Reb is saying that we have to publicize that God is saying this now through the prophets. See, I give before you the blessing. That literally today we see with our physical eyes the blessing of the redemption. And the Rebbe says that we have to add and emphasize that this declaration, this publicity, has to be done also by those that still haven't gotten this completely. They don't completely internalize, absorb, understand this. So if I don't understand it myself, how can I give it over to someone else? But the rabbi says, since by them they have the belief completely, because we're all believers, every Jew is a believer, therefore they are able, and since they're able, they must publicize these words to others, beginning with their own family, because for sure their family doesn't have to suffer because they don't get it yet. And actually everyone in their environment, and actually every single Jew, and for sure through the appropriate efforts the words that they're saying to other people will be accepted and will do their job, including doing their job by the person who's saying them, the person who's publicizing it, who thinks he doesn't get it yet, that also he will now absorb this in an inward fashion. Very, very powerful, powerful words. And it's in a long time because that was 1991. It's 2022. So definitely... I think we should tell God we've done this. We've done this very well. And we are totally beyond this and just totally ready to see the complete reality of the redemption when all, everything will be healed. The emotions will be healed. The physical elements will be healed. On every level, we will see God revealed for each one of us. Thank you so much for joining. We should have a wonderful week. And please, all of us, me for sure, Try to apply this. We're learning amazing things and we should try to make it real. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.